If you've got a Bible, please turn to Romans chapter 8. Um, if you haven't got a Bible, it will come up on the screen. So in this series on the Spirit, we've been looking uh, at who is the Holy Spirit and what does he do in our lives? We have seen that the Holy Spirit isn't some impersonal force, but he is a person. He is the pers- a person of the Godhead. He is part of the Trinity. He is God himself. In our first talk, we looked at the Spirit of Truth, how Jesus said it was better for him to go so that him and the Father could send the Holy Spirit, that the Spirit would glorify Jesus in the hearts of believers. And in the second talk, we saw that every single person who is a Christian has the Holy Spirit, but there is also this command in Scripture to be ongoingly filled with the Spirit as well. And today we're going to look at a doctrine that I think is sorely needed, sorely needed by everyone, myself included, We're going to be looking at the spirit of adoption. Recently, two people, I was chatting with someone in a small group on Thursday and someone in the prayer meeting at the beginning of church this morning, and both of them said the same thing, that the thing with the spirit of adoption is that once once you get it, it changes everything. It changes everything. Why is it so important? I think so many people are going through their life, Christians and non-Christians, full of fear, feeling like they've got the the weight of the world on their shoulders, feeling alone, feeling like they don't really have a firm foundation beneath their feet. And today what we're going to see is that as people who have received Jesus Christ, who have believed in his name, we have now become children of God. We've been adopted by God into his family, and now we are children of who are safe, and we are secure. And this is, this is not just some theory that's just to, be th- just to be thought, but it is a fact that is also to be felt in the whole of our lives. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. He comes, and he is the spirit of adoption who makes this reality an experience in our lives that changes everything for us. So before we dive in, let me pray. Father, we thank you that you have sent the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, that all of us here who who follow you have your Holy Spirit. And Lord, I just pray that today as we look at the spirit of adoption, that we might listen to what you have to say to us and that we would experience this adoption that you have won for us. Amen. Amen. So, in Romans chapter 8, let's look at the... We're going to be looking at verses 12 to 17, but we're going to take it just a couple of verses at a time. So, from Romans 8, verse 12, says this. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. For if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So, In these first two verses, Paul is setting up this contrast between these two things, the spirit and the flesh. And the spirit and the flesh seem to um, have different desires, different desires that are odds with one another. So let me tell you a story. So um, a few months ago now, uh, as a family with some friends, we decided that we were going to go to the Panto at the Milo this year for Christmas. Um, Judah, my three-year-old, has been extremely excited for it. We managed to get cheap tickets through preschool. Looking forward to it with our friends. It's going to be really great. And, um, but then a few weeks ago, uh, me and my wife sat down just to sync up our diaries, see what's coming up. And um, to my horror, discovered that the Panto is on at exactly the same time as England are playing in the World Cup. <laughs> I know. Yeah. So... There's two conflicting desires within me. You've got football fan Ryan who loves watching England play football. And then you've got Ryan who wants to be an intentional and present dad. Different desires conflict with each other in the situation. I'm, I'm on the phone, I'm messaging Joe Robertson saying, what is it your stupid idea to go to the Panto? What have you done? Um, genuinely, for a few days, thinking, what am I going to do? What, how, how do I work this out? But, you know, thank, I did make the right decision, don't worry. And Judah's not even going to miss me. <laughs> he, he, he won't, no, I'm joking. I, I, I'm going to the Panto, and I'm going to be fully present, fully there, and somehow I'll try and watch the game without finding any, any scores. 
that I'm not saying that is a battle between flesh and spirit necessarily, but that's just an example of how two desires that are inside of us are in conflict and we have to work that out. In the battle between the flesh and the spirit, which one is going to win? So what, 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 is, what is the flesh before I jump ahead too far? Um, Galatians 5 is very helpful here. Galatians 5 verses 19 to 20. It says, Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. We're saying the flesh is about the sinful desire that exists within each and every single one of us. Sometimes we can refer to it as original sin. Every single person has been born with this fleshly desire within themselves. And it presents itself through not just our behaviors, but also our thoughts as well. So, for example, um, do we gossip rather than remain silent? Are we, do we look at things that we know we shouldn't do sometimes? Do we lash out rather than respond in kindness at times? When we do those things we know we shouldn't, that, that's our flesh at work. But on the, con- on the other side of the contrast that Paul has made is, is the Spirit. That we have the Holy Spirit who has taken residence inside ourselves who produces different desires within us. And again in Galatians 5 it says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And receiving the Holy Spirit gives us this new way of desiring. We no longer disregard God, but we love God. Our compass for living is no longer what merely feels right and good to us, but we actually submit our desires to the Holy Spirit. So there is a reality to the Christian life of conflicting desires within yourself, the flesh and the spirit. Have you, have you ever experienced, like you've maybe got like, I've got five minutes coming up here where I could just... I could just sit down, I could just maybe just read my Bible, just pray, just spend some time with the Lord, and you sit down, and next thing you know, you spend that time scrolling on your phone. Or maybe when you have a desire to, that someone's wronged you, and you want to forgive that person because of the forgiveness that you've received in Christ, but actually you spend most of your time daydreaming, imagining scenarios in which you get your vengeance upon that person. There is a very real war happening inside of us, and the scene of that battleground is our desires. So how do we overcome this flesh? How do we overcome these desires? Is it by human means? It's so easy to think that we are the solution to our own problems, isn't it? If only we can just nail down that morning routine. That the lack we find in ourselves can be solved by our own efforts. But it says here in verse 13 that, is by the Spirit that we put to death the deeds of the body. The Spirit who is God, who has come and taken residence inside the heart of those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. He brings a supernatural power that is external to us, inside to us, to give us the strength to deny our flesh the thing it wants. We've been given the power to overcome the fleshly desires. But not that we are going to achieve sinless perfection, this side of Christ's return, but that we are never without hope of overcoming and we are never to give up in our battle against the flesh. But what we see in our passage today is that it's not merely that we're given power by the Spirit, but that the Spirit reveals to us a brand new identity. From verse 14, it says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God as sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. So, in our battle against our flesh, one of the key weapons that we've been given is a brand new identity. Giving in to the passions of the flesh isn't something we just want to try and avoid, it's something that, it's just not who we are anymore. That's not who we are anymore. We're children of God. Going back to that conflict I had in myself between the pantomime and football, which identity is more fundamental to who I am? 
football fan Ryan or trying to be the best father I can be Ryan. But how much more fundamental to my identity than being a father to my children is my being a child of my heavenly father. That is our most truest, most fundamental, most controlling identity that we are to live with now that we are children of God. There's no other identity that comes before it. Imagine that, um, imagine that you've only ever lived in Canterbury, that you were, you were born in Canterbury, so you've got a British passport. Culturally, you're British. But suppose one day you discovered that you actually weren't born in Canterbury, you are actually born in some, some town in France. So you actually receive a new passport. You have received a, a new national identity. But the thing is, although you're, you technically have a new identity, a new national identity, nothing's changed. Culturally, you're still British. You've never lived in France. You can't speak French. You don't feel French. You don't like French food. Nothing's really changed. This is not the kind of identity change that Paul is talking about here. This is not some technicality. This is a a new identity that changes our very self-understanding of who we are. An identity that becomes the most important thing to us. An identity that transforms us from the inside out. Identity that we are now children of God. And there's another contrast here in the passage between the spirit of adoption and the spirit of slavery. Paul makes it clear elsewhere that this spirit of slavery, what it means, it means to be enslaved to sin, to be enslaved to those fleshly desires that were laid out. All of us, every single person here, we are enslaved to the rule of our strongest desires, without exception. We like to think that we we have free will, that we have the ability to choose freely between different options. But actually, we are enslaved to our strongest desires. All natural desires that we are born with, although I want to acknowledge we are capable of doing good as humans, They're all infected. They're all infected by this sin because we don't seek to honour God and the flourishing and the good of others. And this is one of those things that it feels hard to hear and it's quite easily rejected emotionally. But if you think about it, it's clearly one of the most truest things in the world when we look around and within ourselves. And this is part of the Spirit's work, that he comes and he makes us children of God with new desires that are at odds with those natural desires. And so we're presented with those two ways to live. One, in submission to our own natural desires and inclinations, which is to be in slavery and fear, or to be in submission to our good heavenly Father, who loves us and knows what's best for us. Maybe you're here this morning and you wouldn't call yourself a Christian. You wouldn't say, I'm I'm not a child of God, I, I don't know about any of this, but you're interested. Maybe, maybe you do want to become a child of God. You might be thinking, how is it that I receive this adoption? What can I do? How is it that I can become a child of God? Well, I want to take us to um, an amazing verse in John chapter 1, verse 12. And I've intentionally left out some blank bits, in, some, some bits in there. Because our natural thoughts would be that maybe... The, the qualifications for how it is that God would give us the right to become children of God. Maybe it's, but all who prove themselves worthy, who work to earn it, he gave the right to become children of God. Maybe that's, we, that's what our natural instincts would be. But what it actually says is incredible. It says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So will you receive Jesus today? Will you believe in his name and become a child of God? Because being a child of God isn't a wage to be earned. It is a gift to be received. Will you receive Jesus today? This is one of the reasons why we celebrate and love and worship the God-man Jesus Christ so much. Because what he was doing when he was killed on that cross, he was making many sons and daughters. Jesus isn't, didn't come just to make a bunch of heartless, obedient, fearful servants. 
Jesus came not to turn sinners into subjects, but he came to turn sinners into sons and daughters. That's the invitation to anyone here who isn't a follower of Jesus today. And what is the invitation today to those who are followers of Jesus? Well, I think it's, um, the invitation is assurance. That the spirit of adoption wants to give us assurance today. In verse 16 it says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Read that first bit again. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Bear, bears witness. What does that mean? It's, it's courtroom language. Think of someone who goes to a court to bear witness. What they're doing is they're, they're testifying to the truth. And thankfully, as you saw in talk one, that the spirit is a spirit of truth and that he cannot lie. So whatever he testifies to is utterly and totally true. And what is he testifying to? That we are children of God. The Holy Spirit brings assurance to our spirits that we are children. And that is who we are. And this is a secure identity. This is not a kind of identity that you get from the world that's based on your performance that can be snatched away if you don't perform enough. It's not a flimsy thing. This identity is not like sand that will cause you to sink when a storm comes. This identity is a solid rock, an identity that you are truly, truly safe in. Because it's not like you've become a child and now you must work really hard to stay a child. Because being a child of God is not a standard to attain to, but it is an identity to live out of. Do you see the difference? You don't attain to being a child of God and work hard to maintain it, but you've received being a child of God, and now you live your life in light of that identity that you've received that you are safe and secure in. They're very different ways of living. How does a child justify their status as a son or daughter to their parent? They don't. They are their son or daughter. That's just who they are. No parent wants their child to ever wonder whether or not they are their child. Of course, a a parent wants their child to live in a certain way. A A parent wants their child to be obedient. But when the child fails at that, it never crosses the parent's mind to think, you are now no longer my child because you have messed up. That's not how it works. It is more like, I received an incredible gift of a secure and safe identity as a child of God, so how could I not want to live in light of that? How could I not want my life to be one of, of gratitude in response to this childhood that I received? So we don't put the, to death the deeds of the flesh to become children, but because we already are children. And living according to flesh just isn't who we are anymore. Church, we can believe his voice of assurance today. We can believe it. Which voice is telling you the truth here? This is just a little insight into, into Ryan's little mind and what happens on a daily basis, near yeah, enough. The voice that says, ah, oh, you've messed it up again. You're not a very good Christian at all, are you? Maybe you're not a Christian, maybe you're not really a Christian at all. Go on, give in, or just try again and just get things right to prove to God that you are good enough for him. That's one voice. The other voice that whispers, you are a child of God. You belong to God. He has made you his own. Live your life in light of this identity, not in pursuit of trying to earn it. So in your life, receive the assurance of God today if you have placed your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Something else we saw in that first talk in the series was about how the Spirit takes what is Christ's and will declare it to us. What is it that Christ most fundamentally has? Who is Christ most essentially? He is the Son of God. He has sonship. The Spirit takes Jesus' sonship and he declares it to us. We are as loved by the Father as Jesus is because we are now in Christ. We do not address God as a servant addresses their master, but with a reverent fear, we we do get to call him our father. 
It says in that passage that we now cry, Abba, Father, as children of God. And that word Abba is a really interesting one because it's not the same language that Paul is writing in. He keeps it in the Aramaic, which is what Jesus, when Jesus uses the word Abba, he's speaking Aramaic, and he uses the word Abba to refer to the Father. So what Paul is doing is he's making it very clear that we are drawn into the very experience of the Father that Jesus has. That we get to call God Abba because Jesus called his Father Abba. We are drawn into his relationship. I want to ask you, is is Jesus, the Son of God, secure in his status as a son? Yes, he's very secure. The same can be said for you. You are secure in the Father because you're in Christ. His Father is now your Father. As we said at the beginning, this adoption isn't just something that's technically true, something that's written down on some legal document in heaven and hidden away that has no real bearing on our lives. It's not that new passport that we spoke about earlier that makes no difference. This adoption is experienced through the spirit of adoption who bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. In our passage as well, it, it's, surprisingly it starts to talk about suffering, which it might sound a bit surprising that Paul goes there. One of the consequences of being a child of God is not that we are going to have a life of ease. Being adopted by God does not guarantee you a life of ease. Having God as our Father does not mean we are protected from any kind of suffering. Suffering for the sake of Christ is actually part of our adoption. So, firstly, don't ever be tempted to think that suffering for the sake of Christ is a sign that God has left you. That when you are stepping out into things and you encounter suffering and you think, God, I've done this for you. Why am I experiencing suffering? Are you not in this? That's not a sign that God's left you. Suffering is a part of being adopted in Christ. That we are, we, it's actually, the Bible talks about it as being like an honor to be suffering with Christ and for Christ. He doesn't give us a life of ease, our Father, but what he does give us is stability through the storm. A house that is built on the rock and not the sand. And so when the storm comes, we are not swept away. And, and that stability, that strength is, is known that even through this, my God, my Father, is working all things together for my good. Trusting in God's fathering of us through the trial will give us comfort and stability to stand. The person who knows who they are in God, their hope is not in their circumstance. They don't look to their circumstances to interpret God's feelings towards them. But what they do is they look to God's faring of them to interpret their circumstances. So suffering for Christ doesn't undermine or destroy our identity. If we take hold of it, we'll realize that there is nothing that life can throw at us that will take this away from us. So let me just, as we come, come to an end, let me just like go through some applications what does it mean to, be, to live our lives as those who are adopted? What happens when the spirit of adoption bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God? What happens when we grasp it and really take hold of it and receive that assurance? Well, the first thing I want to talk about is inadequacy. Um, many, if not all of us, will live with a sense of inadequacy. It could be inadequacy in your vocation, in your relationships, inadequacy before God. And I'm not here to tell you that that's not true. I'm not here to say, no, no, ignore that. You're wonderful. You're amazing. Ignore the haters. You're incredible. I'm not here to say that to you. I'm here to say that the truth is we are all going to be inadequate in life. We all have areas in our life where we don't make the cut. But I want to say is your inadequacy can do nothing to negatively affect your status as a child of God. It is while we were dead in our trespasses that God made us alive with Christ. It is while we were enemies of God that Christ saved us. It was while we were still sinners. Our status as children is entirely based on the mercy and grace of God and not on our performance. So, of course, our inadequacy can do nothing to affect our identity. 
A sense of inadequacy without resting in your identity crushes you. But a sense of inadequacy while resting in your identity as a child of God is actually a source of joy. Because what it does is it magnifies the grace and love of our Father. It's that even, even despite this, he still loves me. Even though I'm rubbish at this, even though I've let people down, even though I'm not doing a good job here, even though I've made that mistake, God still loves me. He's still my Father. I'm still a child of God. And so we don't have to justify our existence, our identity through our performance. And you know, this really like preparing me, me personally, preparing for this sermon. This is sort of like where, like, and, and what I'm preaching about is that really hitting home for me right now in my pro, in my sermon prep. So like, can I? I could preach a dud today. It could be absolutely rubbish, but God still loves me. I could preach a dud today, and my identity is not shaken, because actually, my identity is not in how good can I preach. My identity is that I am a child of God. And in the same way, any competence or successes that we have does nothing to positively affect your status as a child either. So if you feel like you're prevailing, if you're doing, being really successful in life and you've got a Christian ministry that's going really well, make sure you don't rejoice in the wrong thing. In, um, in Luke chapter 10, Jesus, he sends out the 72 to go and do ministry, and, and they come back rejoicing. They say, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And then Jesus replies to them, he says, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So the, the, the disciples, they're super excited. Look how successful the ministry has been. We're so excited about the successes of the ministry. And Jesus is saying, don't be excited about that. Rejoice in the fact that your name is in heaven. Rejoice in the fact that your God knows you, that you have a place in his family. That's what you are to rejoice in. It's possible to be doing extremely well as a Christian externally and feeling good about it for the wrong reasons. The danger is that we don't want to be fruitful for the glory of God, but we want to be fruitful to be seen as successful in the eyes of other Christians. Let's make sure we are rejoicing in the right thing, in our status as children of God. Also, as children of God, we don't need to be loved and liked by everyone. We don't need to be loved and liked by everyone because we have the affection of the Father. If you, I'm speaking to myself here, like if you have a, like you find yourself in all different social contexts and you think, I just want everyone to think well of me. If you think like that and you live for that, you can't possibly be consistent with your convictions. You're going to compromise your convictions in order for, to get everyone to love you and like you and think well of you. But actually, having the spirit of adoption, being adopted children, we'd be like, actually, I can, stay, I can stay true to my convictions without being worried about people not liking me because I know I have the love and the affection of the Father. I loved it when um, Aaron came to share about inviting his best mate to, to Alpha and he was like, there's that fear, isn't there, of like, oh, if you reject me. But and actually, it didn't lead to Aaron feeling, oh, I feel totally rejected, but there was, there was almost like a joy and an assurance from God that came from that. We can invite people to Alpha, even if we think there's probably a 99% chance they're going to say no, and we might feel a bit awkward, might be in awkward silence afterwards. But actually, I can do that because I have the love and affection of my Father. And I don't have to live my life trying to get everyone to think well of me at 100% of the time. That's not my goal in life. Can I invite um, the band back up on stage? So we've um, just got a little bit of time just to, just to respond now. Um, And so I guess there's, there's two real camps, really. Um, those of you who aren't Christians, but you've heard this and you want to become a child of God. And those of you who are Christians and you need to know the assurance that being a child of God brings. For those of us who are Christians, you need to um, know, that, know that assurance. It's, um, it's interesting, from, what, from my research and just hearing different stories, Children who have been adopted, it can take time for them to really, um, for their status as a child to become instinctive. Actually, they, they are, by their status, they are a child of their, of their parents, but 
actually it can take years sometimes to, to really actually settle in of like, oh, you're not going anywhere. I, I am a child. I can relax into that. We can be, it's, it's possible to be a Christian without really living in that assurance, that instinctive identity of who we are. And so I want to pray for us today that if we're there, that the spirit of adoption would bear witness with your spirit that you are a child of God. Um, and also, I just want to acknowledge as well about, we're talking a lot about God being our father and being adopted by him and how that's great news. Whereas there's probably some people in here when I talk about a father, your earthly father is actually a source of quite a lot of difficulty for you to think about. And that makes it hard for you to think about why is it good news for, for me to have a heavenly father when my father has caused me so much pain. And um, whether that's through your father being absent or whether that's because your father had a dark side. Um, but what I, what I want to say is that our heavenly father is not an absent father. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And our heavenly father does not have a dark side. That there is no shadow in our God that he is light. Um, and so I, want, I just want to just carry that and, understand, and just say I do understand that this might be difficult for some people to, to, to get this and to receive that. Let me pray, and then I'm going to hand over to Jackie. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you have sent your spirit of adoption into those who, who love you, who have put their faith and trust in you. Thank you that... Jesus, you are to be received, that we respond to what you have done, that you offer yourself freely to us as a gift. And Jesus, I thank you that it's through that that we've been made children, not through our striving, not through our earning, not through deserving it. And so, Lord God, I just pray for anyone in this room who, who hasn't experienced that, who doesn't know you as a father, who doesn't know you as, as a good God who loves and I just pray Jesus that you would reveal yourself to them through your Holy Spirit Holy Spirit come and glorify Jesus come and glorify the Father this morning in their hearts and and Lord also pray for those of us in this room who who know that we know we're adopted we know this is true but actually we find it hard to actually let it settle down for it to become instinctive and and Father God I pray that you would come and do a work of bearing witness with spirits this, this morning for bringing reassurance that they are children of God. In Jesus' name, amen.